Hello, hello. Welcome to SUSUCON Digital 22. My name is Patrick Thomas. I'm a C4 cloud strategist with Dell Technologies. And who else do I have on the line with me? Hi, folks. Jerry Ness here. I'm also on the C4 team uh, focused on cloud and containers, uh, one of uh, Patrick's colleagues. So the C4 team at Dell, uh, C4 stands for Customer Centric Cloud and Containers. We really look at the strategy of our customers' entire cloud implementation. Um, and at Dell, cloud to us means multi-cloud. Um, all our customers are using some sort of SaaS service, as well as private cloud and public cloud, and, and that's what we like to see. We definitely want all our customers to adopt cloud. Um, and Jerry, I was talking about cloud just a second ago. What are we actually talking about today uh, in, in this session? Yeah, so today we're going to talk about Kubernetes uh, on Dell Technologies uh, with our partnership with uh, SUSE and Rancher. Excellent. So before we dive into it, um, I did just want to take a minute to talk about cloud and, and how we see it. So there's obviously the NIST definition of cloud about multi-tenancy and service-based and metered service, accessible from anywhere, all those kind of NIST definitions. But our customers, when they say cloud, they mean lots of different things. I mean, cloud could be uh, the iTunes cloud, right? It could be cloud desktops or cloud uh, whatever. Um, so we've boiled it down to what cloud is really about and why are we doing this cloud thing? So to us, cloud is really a practice that provides value to the organization by optimizing how you deliver the technology services you deliver to whomever your consumers are. You may be your own cloud consumer, right? If you're the provider, you're the, you're the consumer as well. Um, you may be having customers that are the consumer. And so really cloud is about optimizing how we deliver these services and Kubernetes being a huge part of that. Um, when we think about optimizing the delivery of these tech technology services, there's really a, you know, three high level pillars that I think about mentally. First is the performance pillar, which is about performance and velocity. Um, performance is different than velocity. Performance is all about the performance of the, the service itself, that instance of the service that you're delivering. Whereas velocity is more about how fast can I deliver that service, the multi multitude of instances, how fast can I iterate it, how fast can I introduce new services, um, and so velocity and performance, different things, but it's still kind of the, you know, speed or pillar. Next is the security control and governance, or as, you know, we like to call, you know, coax, you know, common orchestration, uh, automation, governance and security, right? So there's a lot of differences between what security is for things like, uh, you know, cyber attacks, as well as what control is, how much can you actually manipulate that, things about governance for compliance or um, ensuring policies are being met and such. So there's a lot of different things that you can optimize in that pillar. Um, the third pillar, and really the, these first three apply to any service we're talking about. The third pillar is really about costs, funding and efficiency. So really financials, it's a financial pillar. So how do we optimize financials and what's the difference between costs, funding and efficiency? So costs are really, you know, what are you paying for, right? What is the, the dollar amount that you're paying? You always want to kind of reduce that dollar amount. Um, you want to pay the minimum possible for doing what you need to do at the highest level quality you can get. And funding is things about uh, like CapEx versus OpEx. Is it, should it be an operational expense? Should it be a capital expenditure? How do we as a company do uh, accounting and finance? And there's many reasons to go CapEx, many reasons to go OpEx. You know, I, I typically look at OpEx as a great model when you're delivering a service to an external entity, to a customer of yours. Um, whereas CapEx is typically the better um, ROI type model to actually own that asset. And, you know, you may have difficulty with cash flow or you may be rich in cash flow so an operational expense model or a subscription to resources for the service that you're using to build your service to deliver to your consumer um, makes more sense to use an opex model 
And then finally, you know, I think a, a huge advantage on the funding model is you should always have a blend, just like in all accounting practices in business, a blend is best. And what your blend is, is different than what this other company's blend is. And so being able to um, use Dell Technologies, which has a huge advantage of being able to offer both that CapEx model and OpEx model for funding of your cloud without changing the underlying technologies that you're using. And so this is kind of a unique position that we have. Most of the times when people think cloud, they're thinking about just consuming cloud. But all companies should be some sort of cloud provider and they should be consuming resources from other cloud services, be it infrastructure or whatever, uh, yeah, app, OpEx or CapEx, and then using those services to build whatever they need to build. So funding is key. Dell has a huge advantage of being able to allow your accounting to and finance groups to um, balance what works best for you as a you as a business, you as a company between your cap, capex and opex without having to change the tech underlying technology. Whereas we see a lot of customers are challenged in public cloud um, because there's only an opex model. It's only it's all 100% subscription. There is no capital model for these same resources that you would use. So huge ad advantage there. I think the, the other advantage that Dell really has, Dell Technologies has, is resource efficiency. So if you think about how, what's the cost model look like for cloud providers as you acquire resources from them? We'll use a very simple example of a virtual machine, um, a Windows operating system or Linux operating system. Uh, or are you in volumes or containers or Kubernetes? Any of these services that we talk about are typically in an instance-based model. And the big fallacy here is that you pay for what you use. And it's complete, completely inaccurate, right? You typically, in the majority of services, you're paying for what you've asked for. Regardless if you're using 10% or 100%, you've been allocated a set of resources and that's what you're paying for. So you're not paying for what you use, you're paying for what you're given, you're paying for what you've asked for. And obviously there are some services that don't follow that model, uh, but they are few and far between. The majority of spend in a customer's cloud model is going to be on instances that are in that you pay for what you ask for model. Um, again, Example of virtual machines, um, same with containers, is that you have this instance and it has CPU, memory, disk, network assigned to it. Um, if you're using 20% of the CPU, this instance on the left versus this instance on the right, they can't share the unused resources within that instance allocation, right? So your efficiency is pretty bad. And this is not something that most people coming into cloud realize. This is the model from 20, 40 years ago where you had a physical asset assigned to an instance, say a Windows operating system, Linux operating system, the 10% it was utilizing, it was using, the 90% it wasn't utilizing was captive to that instance. And that's the same model we see in a lot of public cloud today. So a huge advantage that Dell Technologies has in either a sovereign adjacent cloud or in a private cloud is that you have that set of resources, the aggregate of it, and you, you as the provider are doing the allocations to your instances, meaning that you can share this, the shared resources or you can share the unused resources within that instance with other instances of yours. So this is a huge level of efficiency gain. Um, and it's something that when you're looking at your cost model for resources to provide to your services, um, you really need to consider the costs, the funding, and the efficiency. So let's set that aside for now. And uh, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about uh, Cloud Native. Is there uh, anybody you want to consider, Jerry, when we start thinking about Cloud Native? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, there's this movement now, um, cloud, cloud native applications. It's, it's a modern way to build and run applications. And, and, and a lot of it hinges on open source projects. 
And uh, there, it's the it's the wild west out there when it comes to a lot of these open source projects. So there's a there's an organization that that uh, a lot of experts and companies in the industry have joined into called the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and they provide us uh, a, a number of uh, tools to help us in our in our cloud native journey, whether it's uh, how to build applications with microservices or containers or Kubernetes and whatnot. And there's a couple of things that I like to go to them for, one of them being this cloud native trail map. They say, if you want to build a platform to build and run cloud native applications, here's uh, the, the trail map of projects that you should consider using in your architecture. Uh, right at the top of the list on, on one through 10 is containers. So we're gonna build uh, our applications in a, in a method that they can be containerized. Uh, and uh, as we go down this, this trail map, you're gonna see things like Kubernetes and networking and storage and whatnot. So this is uh, a way uh, to uh, get an opinion on how to build an architecture to run those cloud native applications. So, so Jerry, it's, it sounds pretty simple. It's a 10 step process. <laughs> yeah, if it, if it were only so simple, if there was only 10 projects to plug in here. On our next slide here, we're gonna see, this is the cloud native landscape. This is all of the projects that Cloud Native Compute Foundation is keeping their eyes on to build out an architecture. And man, it's overwhelming. Uh, if I was to build a, a an architecture for uh, perhaps a DevOps uh, practice, I'm gonna go through and start to pick and choose projects and stitch them together. This is overwhelming uh, and it is not the way I would go about doing it. Yeah, I see um, I see some of our customers went down this path and the, the nuance, the, uh, the back and forth, the amount of engineering that they have to do just to get their resources is just, it's insane, right? Um, it just, that's not what you should be spending your engineering time on. You should be spending your engineering time on the product that you're developing to sell to your customers or to, to deliver to your consumers, right? Um, but how, what, what do I do with these, I don't know, it looks like 2000 projects. Yeah. So let's do this. Why don't we go to one of our, um, Supported distribution vendors, any of the Linux vendors out there today have an opinion. They've gone through this uh, this trail map. They've gone through this landscape, and they've picked the projects to build the platform. Granted, uh, most all of them are using Kubernetes today as that orchestration and scheduling layer, but there's all these other pieces they stitch together, and they will provide you a validated, supported distribution. And the one we're talking about here today Susa, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, there, there's more than just one distribution, right? You know, when we think about Kubernetes, there's actually a distribution of Kubernetes, just like distributions of Linux. Uh, but there's a distribution of the container platform itself. And that's the key one, right? Choose whichever distribution of Kubernetes you want, right? Because, you know, I want to use this. See, uh, container runtime versus this container runtime or, or whatever other reasons you have for choosing a Kubernetes distribution. But the big piece is the management of all those things. So let's talk about, you know, SUSE Rancher and what distributions uh, they provide. So at the bottom, before we think about the higher level services that we require, right, to run this environment, you need a Kubernetes distribution. And SUSE has, a, so one of them being RKE. Um, so RKE is Rancher Kubernetes Engine. Uh, another one being K3S. So Jerry, what what's the difference between, like why would I use RKE versus K3S? Yeah, certainly. Uh, RKE is, is based on the upstream Kubernetes uh, uh, that is, is tried and true that, that everyone is using in, in their cloud native architectures. Uh, Rancher has gone off and also developed a very lightweight uh, version of Kubernetes that uh, is used primarily in remote offices, branch offices, and absolutely in edge 
and IoT uh, architectures as well now. So that's getting a big play when I start looking at moving uh, compute containers out to the edge. We're going to use a very lightweight version of that called K3S. So the other interesting thing is that we, we talked about Rancher having all these capabilities above the Kubernetes layer, so to speak. Uh, one thing we didn't mention is it's not only Rancher distributions of Kubernetes that Rancher itself supports, these upper level services support. Um, and it's not only distributions. So Rancher also supports Kubernetes as a service. So we have to look at the, the three big public cloud providers. Amazon has uh, Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS. Azure has Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS. And Google has GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. So these are different than distributions. These are services. And a lot of these vendors also have distributions as, of Kubernetes as well, right? You talk about like EKS Anywhere is different than EKS. Uh, what about VMware? You know, what distribution does VMware have? So VMware has Tanzu. Uh, Canonical has a distribution. Red Hat has a distribution. Um, there's a lot of other key players in Kubernetes um, market in, in that space today. And Rancher is able to do these day two, including day one operations and day three operations. So if we move up to the next layer with Rancher, how are we dealing with authorization and security and secrets and all these other things um, to be able to interact with these Kubernetes clusters? How are we dealing with uh, our catalogs, our Helm charts, or our, our monitoring of observability and alerts and log files and all these other things? Kubernetes already has this figured out. Uh, or the interfaces for these things. But what projects do you use to do those? And that's where Rancher comes in with their centralized management of all your Kubernetes distributions, the instances of those distributions, but providing the key services around those Kubernetes APIs to be able to do the things you need to do for governance and security and monitoring and all these other things. The We've talked about the what, what are we, you know, what, what is it? We talk about Rancher has a centralized piece to it. It also has these distributions of Kubernetes to it. Um, but what do our customers need? Why are they even doing Kubernetes or containers or whatever? And so at the highest level, I kind of split it up into three. There are our central IT, corporate IT, normal IT operations, Historically, they were receiving software as packages in uh, EXE file, an RPM, whatever, zip file, tar file, whatever, um, running that in an operating system, Windows or Linux, and, and doing that. So with the advent of containers in Kubernetes, the software developers of those products that IT is using need to iterate faster and do things more optimally in their software development lifecycle. So they have adopted container platforms and Kubernetes platforms, and they're now starting to distribute that software to IT as Helm charts and containers. So IT needs a way to run that. And this is the, the most simplistic use case or most simplistic kind of customer that we see. I just need to run some containers. How can I do that simply? Moving up in a little bit for uh, complexity, is product groups, software development. They need to do things like uh, development, QA, um, support their customers. And so they need environments where they can turn on pods of containers that have their product in different versions for their development lifecycle, but also for their QA lifecycle and also for their support. How do I support my customers when they come to me with this weird issue I've never seen before I need to be able to replicate that and duplicate that. And the container orchestration and, and the way that this logic works or this, this model works um, allows them to do those things. So they need to do continuous integration as well as support and, and throw up a multitude of instances of their product. And Rancher helps us there as well. Finally, we have the more complex and um, where we see companies investing a lot into. 
is we think about uh, as a company in 2022, subscription services, reoccurring revenue models, that's where most all companies are going. So they're shrink wrapped off the shelf software moving into a subscription service. How does that service actually run? What's going on behind the scenes? And that's a service group. So not only do, does that group need the continuous integration that the product group needed, right, for doing the development, but they also need continuous deployment. So they need to do new versions of their service that they're offering as a subscription. They need to manage that and they need to scale. And again, those that's a multitude of open source projects that they need to run. And SUSE Rancher bundles all that together to make it very easy for you to adopt these DevSecOps operating practices for continuous deployment. So Jerry, what, what does Dell EMC have to offer? Yeah, so let's take all this and put it together. Let's take the software from SUSE Rancher. Uh, let's take the hardware from Dell server network storage, and let's build an architecture that uh, combines the goodness of all of that. So we've taken uh, a, an approach where we've co-engineered solutions, uh, a number of them. Uh, this one solution here that we're speaking about uh, is let's place the lightweight SUSE, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro with that lightweight K3S that I mentioned on top of PowerEdge servers. A great example of how to run Kubernetes at the edge. And by the way, all of this, these design guides and implementation guides and whatnot can be found at a site called infohub.delltechnologies.com. And you'll you'll be able to find this. And and these these uh, practices that we built are clearly built around that uh, CNCF trail map that we've talked about uh, before. And this is this is the first example of, of that. So let's look at what these architectures kind of look like. And um, thanks for calling out InfoHub. There's a lot of great documents in there. InfoHub.DellTechnologies.com, you know, SUSE Rancher, uh, and it'll pull up that document we're referring to. So let's talk about a, an implementation on uh, what we commonly see is a virtualization environment. Uh, it, and, and why do we see that? Well, first, people know virtualization. Second, um, resource efficiency out of virtualization is great. I mean, if you think about the performance of uh, and efficiency of the resource schedule, scheduler that VMware has, it's it's the best, right? Um, they already have these environments, and why not run my virtual machines next to my containers, pulling out of the same aggregate pool of resources to improve my efficiency, not only in resource efficiency but operational efficiency. So that underlying layer, um, pull it out of a virtualization environment to get benefits of virtualization. Um, or some, some of our customers do bare metal. The customers that are doing bare metal, they may have needs. They may have uh, requirements for certain GPUs that may not be supported by the virtualization platform or FPGAs or whatever else they need, right? So they may have to go bare metal, um, but these architectures allow for that. There's an advantage in virtualization. And here's, here's one of the examples is uh, RKE2. This is actually a federal uh, example for high, high compliance security requirements. In this example, it's three VxRail nodes, uh, VxRail being the hyperconverged infrastructure platform from Dell EMC, uh, one of the most widely used platforms for VMware hyperconverged environments. Uh, we chose this for this example and they put Rancher on top of it. So Rancher Management Server uh, has its own Kubernetes cluster that it's running its pods within for all those you know, um, Helm charts and Grafana and all these other things to support the workload cluster. On the right-hand side here, we have another set of VxRail nodes with another Kubernetes cluster, RKE2 Kubernetes distribution running on it, running in their workloads. And finally, we have a, a third one, but it's actually not a cluster. Right? It's, it's a single node implementation of Kubernetes distribution, RKE2, for an edge situation or an edge scenario. And the beauty here is that Rancher 
is managing all three of these different Kubernetes implementations, two of them being clusters, one of them being a single node, uh, it can just as likely manage a number of other Kubernetes as a service services, as well as say a K3S or a canonical Kubernetes distribution or a Tanzu Kubernetes distribution. Um, there's a long list of supported Kubernetes distributions because those distributions are all CNCF compliant for Kubernetes. So Rancher is able to do the day, day one operations of implementation, installing, building a cluster for Kubernetes. Day two operations of, you know, the standard, I need to go from version one to version two of my infrastructure, of my platform, uh, as well as of these higher level services. I need to do the upgrades there. Uh, and then day three services of, hey, I needed to deploy stuff into that cluster. So Rancher helps you on all of those fronts. So to wrap up, what, what do we have for wrap up, Jerry? Yeah, so uh, before we uh, run through this, uh, these resources here, just one other comment for you on that VxRail cluster configuration. You know, there's, there's also those customers uh, down in the bottom right there. There's also those customers that might need uh, access to a persistent storage. And one thing that Dell is doing is a lot of work in this world of container storage interface plugins uh, to allow me to create volumes right within my Kubernetes interface. Uh, and we've, we've taken it beyond that now, not just the ability to create and destroy volumes and attach those volumes to containers and pods. But the idea here is now we're doing something called container storage modules and extending those capabilities of those storage platforms into uh, the users of Kubernetes. So things like governance and security that you mentioned earlier on the storage platforms, uh, observability of that storage and uh, uh, replication of those storage volumes, things of those, those higher level services are now presented through CSM at the Kubernetes users. So that's an exciting uh, thing that we're doing also uh, uh, down there at that infra layer. Yep, and now to the the final uh, resources here. Here's here's a number of resources that you can get much more detailed information around the VxRail systems, the SUSE Rancher Rancher Kubernetes engine on VxRail, uh, as well as the SUSE Rancher resources documentation and whatnot. Full of uh, implementation guides, design guides things of that sort. So reach out to your representative at Dell or at SUSE or reach out to one of us and we can help you on your journey uh, going down this uh, cloud native uh, trail map. Excellent. Well, thank, thanks for uh, sitting this session with me, Jerry. I think it was really important stuff. Uh, I will go ahead and wrap up. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. And you all enjoy this week.